Hello everybody, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 56. As I am going on holiday this weekend, this is being recorded at some stupid hour of the night on uh, Thursday night or possibly Friday morning. And so I am going to have to cut out and skip a few of the regular bits of the Dry Dock. I'm going to basically take the questions from the two videos for this week, which are the Hunt Class Destroyer video and the Vic H Miss Victory video, and then throw in some Patreon questions at the end. And the duration of this Dry Dock is basically going to be for as long as I can go up to the normal time without actually falling asleep. I will try and make that up with a Q&A live stream at some point next week, probably Wednesday evening, I would think. Um, other than that, the only other bit of the channel admin is this. Behold, a medal. And this is not just any medal, this is a medal that, well, some of you can have, because uh, through a uh, friend at Dash Contact of mine who runs uh, his own YouTube channel and makes really nice stuff like this, um, I've managed to commission 50 of these lovely little uh, medals and uh, they are available at the link in the description. Um, it's an Etsy link because that seemed about the easiest way to set them up uh, for sale. But yeah, so if you would like to um, have a medal to show your support for the channel, uh, they're available there. And I will be personally packaging each one, so if you want a custom message of some kind that's not uh, too off the wall, uh, feel free to include that in the uh, comment or whatever. Um, so yeah, they're available if you want them. And I've retained a few more f uh, for awards to various people if they do something that uh, amuses, entertains, or otherwise uh, makes me grateful to them. Glenn Riccafrente asks, could you please do another ship versus ship special? Yeah, yeah, I can probably do one at some point in September. Um, I know there's plenty of ship versus ship requests. So I can lump them all into that one. Um, it's just a matter of finding the time. Because <laughs> there's a lot of ships in a single ship versus ship special video. Jacob Kirkland asks, What is your opinion of the game Rule the Waves 2? Um, generally, good. Um, there's definitely improvements over Rule the Waves uh, 1. Uh, the only comment, negative comments I would have so far are that one, they do take the British national trait uh, and the one, one national weakness to rather extreme degrees. I haven't been in a single engagement with more than uh, about four or five capital units where something hasn't randomly, spontaneously exploded. It's like, yes, haha, ha, it was very funny the first six times. I'm not beaty, I didn't take away the flipping flash door protection, all right? <laughs> um... Yeah, anyway. Um, also, for various reasons associated with the game AI, virtually everything seems to descend into a close-range pell-mell melee or else a stern chase. Um, and in either case, the solution to that appears to be build vast numbers of triple, uh, of three-quad or four-quad launcher um, destroyers, um, heavily obviously heavily on with torpedoes and stick torpedo launchers and everything else because after about the first five ten minutes of the game you're just going to end up in a swirling melee anyway so you might as well dump massive numbers of torps in the water and then everybody dies um uh, yeah that though that i think yeah of the two i think that latter one is probably the the larger criticism would it's basically just yeah try try and make the ai something that will actually do vaguely conventional line tactics rather than this uh well i don't mind the trafalgar-esque stack tactic it's just something you can horribly abuse to win but i'd rather play a game which i didn't have to horribly abuse um ai glitches in order to come out victorious all the time cessna t asks was the concept of a pt boat carrier ever considered well, in terms of a vessel that carried small motor on torpedo boats around and load them into the water and set them all running, um, it was considered, and a few of them were even built back in the day when torpedo boats were a brand new thing. Um, it rapidly proved somewhat impractical because torpedo boats <laughs> began to grow very rapidly in size. Um, but the idea of some kind of mothership that would serve as a base for PT boats and potentially could service them and could definitely reload them, etc., was um, actually uh, carried through the entire era of 
well, torpedo boats, then small destroyers, and then once destroyers have gotten too big to need it, um, back down to uh, coastal motorboats and what would later be motor torpedo boats, PT boats, S boats, etc. Um, in the picture above, you can see one of the US examples from the Second World War. Thomas Colbert asks, please give us a treatise on the origin of the term loose cannon and what needed to be done by the crew on occasions when the term became a reality. Not sure about a treatise, but I'll try and answer the question as best I can in my uh, need for sleep adult state. Um, so as you can see here, this is the main gun deck of HMS Victory, the, lower, the lowest of the main gun decks with the 32 pounder cannons. And as you will have seen in the HMS Victory video, and weirdly enough, this question comes from the Hunt Class Destroyer video, not the HMS Victory video, but anyway. Um, each cannon was secured in place uh, both by the fact it was on its carriage, but also the whole kit and caboodle was secured to the ship via a series of pulleys and uh, tackle blocks which connected to the cannon via thick ropes. A loose cannon um, was one where it had either slipped from these ropes in some manner, or the rope had broken, or pulley had broken, or the mounting had pulled out, or for whatever reason, the rope and... Uh, restriction system was not working properly. This was a very bad thing to happen uh, because those cannon, especially the, I mean, the 32 pounders, they weigh two to two and a half tons a piece. And those gun carriages do let them move and the gun deck is a fairly flat and open space, but it's also very crowded. So in high seas where the ship's pitching and rolling, um, a, you, a cannon could become a loose cannon by something breaking or neglect or damage or whatever in battle, that would be even worse because at that point you're actually firing the guns, you're basically turning it into a not so recoilless rifle, um, or it, should we say maybe a um, partially solid, solid projectile fueled short term rocket. Um, yeah, you fire one of these things where the mountings aren't completely secure and ready to brace against the recoil and it's going to go rocketing around in, um, backwards or if one of the rope snaps possibly at an angle or in an arc within that gun deck. And they say there's not a lot of space and there's an awful lot of people. There's going to be some very crushed, very squashed and very dead or very badly maimed people very quickly. A cannon coming loose in a storm is actually even worse um, because then obviously the ship's pitching and rolling as we said before in the storm all over the place which means the cannon's going to be happily rolling and pitching all over the place which is probably even worse than in battle because it's just going to keep going as long as the ship keeps pitching and moving and good luck getting that thing stopped whereas at least if it's come loose during a firing it's likely to just do a one path of destruction and then come to a halt so yeah this is the origin of the term loose cannon and why it implies something that's incredibly dangerous what needs to be done by the crew um, first get out the way um, if at all you can avoid it although you're more likely to know about and be able to get out of the way of it in a storm uh, than in battle when it's just like oh exit stage left one cannon um, if it's in a battle you well first you need to unpick the the dead crew from from its wheels and Ideally, if the break isn't too bad, let's say a rope has snapped or something, you can try and uh, re reattach it to the mountings. If one of the mountings is ripped loose or whatever, you would basically just have to try and wedge the wheels and hope it stays in place for the rest of the battle. Um, if it's in the middle of a storm, if it's really flying around, just get out, the, clear the deck, um, or be very, very brave basically um, there's not really an awful lot you can do at that point if it's a bad storm um, I'd say unless unless it falls on its side or something which then obviously everyone can jump on top of it and try and pin it in place until they can tie it down Graham Baxter asks a very open-ended question assuming Germany did not violate the 1839 Treaty of London either by receiving permission to transit without opposition in 1914 or just not invading, invading Belgium assuming Great Britain remained neutral during the rest of the First World War can you speculate on Royal Navy ship development if Britain hadn't been effectively bankrupt during the 20s and 30s well I mean that's a butterfly of a question I mean that's a butterfly the size of a Stella Seagull of a question um, but I'll, I'll try and broadly answer it um, so assuming that for 
whatever reason, Britain remains completely neutral, um, that probably presupposes Germany doesn't get uh, hegemony of the continent, which means it's probably horribly, horribly casualty-causing stalemate on some version of the Western Front with the French involved. Maybe the Germans screw up the initial advance, who knows. But anyway, you've said they remain neutral, so they remain, remain neutral, and we're assuming no massive geopolitical changes as a result of Britain staying out, which is somewhat wishful thinking, but never mind. It is what the question is. Um, Britain of developing without uh, the First World War and therefore not being bankrupt, I think a couple of things are going to happen. One is that the British really liked to stay ahead of their opponents, not just in numbers, but in armament. So obviously, for one of the obvious things that's going to happen, we won't get the renowned class battle cruisers, but we will get all eight of the R-class battleships. Um, we might even get the sixth Queen Elizabeth. You never know, because that was sort of cancelled partially due to uh, the First World War breaking out. And as I said, anyway, the, the Royal Navy likes to stay at the time liked to stay ahead firepower wise of its opponents. Now, at the time that the Queen Elizabeths and the Revengers are being built, they're being built with 15 inch guns, and they're being built to try and one up on the Germans who have just started to roll out some of their um, sort of more, op more optimally designed 12 inch gunships. And at the time when the Germans were rolling out early 12-inch gunships, the British were doing 13.5s. And at the time when the Germans were doing 11s, the British were doing 12s, etc. But you've also got to take into account the US Navy, um, which is sort of a rising naval power of its own. And they're just bringing in the standards around the time of Queen Elizabeth and Revenge, Revenge's designs. And obviously, historically, they would be going on from things like the Nevadas to the Pennsylvanias and so on and so on, up the line, until you get to things like the New Mexico's, the Tennessee's, and then obviously post-war the Colorado's. Now, all of those are armed with 40, 12, 14-inch guns. I can't see the British sitting still on that, and obviously you've got um, the Baden-class Germany theoretically building those in, and um, bringing those into commission in 1916-ish. Um, so you're going to face a ship that's got equal armament, at least on paper, in within about two years and the americans are already building as they their 12 14 inch gun ships so the next class beyond the r's is going to have to if they're going to keep royal navy policy going they're going to have to one up them whether that means putting an extra turret in and going back to one of the early designs for the queen elizabeth with 10 15 inch guns in five twins or whether that means go jumping up a grade and bringing in the first 16 inch gunships probably in some form of enlarged revenge class design maybe a bit faster so eight 16 inch guns and bringing those in in the battleship program of 1915-16 who knows hopefully the battle cruiser design will have gone along the lines of something like design y so they'll be relatively useful going forward um, but i would anticipate that pr probably some form of heavy capital ship i'm going to lean more towards probably a 16 inch gunship will probably show up in at least start building in 15 or 16 whether the, the germans if they're in the middle of a war with france and russia are not going to be in a place to really respond to that um but considering this is the british response to their bardens um whether the americans will That'll tip the balance on the American decision to bring the 16-inch gun earlier, which they did consider on some of the ships that ended up carrying 14-inch guns. Um, remains to be seen, but with the competition from the British 16-inch gun ships, they probably will. And to Lord Fisher's delight, excuse me, <coughs> to Lord Fisher's delight, that will probably uh, cause the Royal Navy to escalate to 18-inch guns. I would imagine they they don't. The Royal Navy of this period don't really tend to like triple turrets, so they're probably going to just escalate in gun calibre to 18-inch weapons, which means that probably by the time you get to the early 1920s, you're going to be seeing... Well, at that point, they're probably going to be forced to accept the triple turret um, purely as a weight and economy measure. But yeah, things... Not necessarily the G3s and the N3s, but something along those lines of 18-inch gun battleships and... 
16 inch gun battle cruisers you're probably going to see in like 19 uh, 19 19 1920 so several years earlier um probably with and this is probably all going to escalate into a, a naval arms race between the British Empire, the USA, and Japan. Japan is going to bankrupt itself doing so unless there's some kind of naval treaty agreed to. And without the economic effects of the First World War, um, <laughs> the British Empire and the US Navy are going to get into an into a very, very big arms race. Um, but that's probably one that, looking at the way things historically worked out, the Royal Navy is probably going to win because they have more political... Not that they necessarily have a huge advantage in industry um, and financing over the USA, although their naval industry is more widespread and more and slightly more capable, but not to the vast degree that they outclass some other, other naval powers. But more critically, the will to spend money on build and maintain the Royal Navy is significantly greater than the political will of the uh, US Congress of the 1910s to actually fund the Navy all that much. So I suspect, we, especially given that they might have anything up to uh, 14 Queen Elizabeths and Revengers rolling around, the Royal Navy's got a huge baseline of, of fairly capable capital ships to give them a head start on and they'll probably maintain that lead until somebody calls time out and decides for some kind of naval treaty that to be signed. Now moving on to questions from the video on HMS Victory. Um, Corporal Tommy asks who would win uh, the US ship of the line USS Pennsylvania or HMS Victory and he says to clarify he's referring to the 1837 USS Pennsylvania <laughs> and not the 1910s era one. Well there's two main factors to consider here. One is what time um, are we taking USS Pennsylvania from because she spent an awful lot of time of her time um, as an uncompleted ship in stocks which is obviously a bit of an unfair fight so that's a bit silly we'll discard that but later in her life she did carry a battery of shell guns replacing some of her regular primary armament so if it's that period then Pennsylvania obviously is going to win because well high explosive shells is not something Victory was ever designed to deal with. Otherwise, assuming that you're referring to Pencil USS Pennsylvania shortly after her launch when she's armed with the more conventional age of sail weaponry, Pennsylvania is quite large. It's got more guns than Victory and they are all 32 pounders so you might think, oh this easy open and shut case. Not quite. Um... And this isn't to say Victory's going to somehow magically win. It's more to do with the fact that Pennsylvania's all 32-pound main armament meant that it wasn't exactly um, all the same in terms of cannons. They basically had to, to in order to get all 32-pounder cannons, the cannons on the main and middle deck were lighter than those on the lower deck. So the lower deck were full 32 pound long guns. Uh, the middle deck had a lighter and weight shorter barrel 32 pounder cannon and the main deck, the upper gun deck, had a another row of 32 pounder cannon but they were shorter still um, and lighter still so they were basically one, effectively one step up above a carronade. That does mean that between her superior numbers of guns and their heavy weight of shot, USS Pennsylvania in a close range firefight such as at Trafalgar, assuming a decent crew, is going to have all the advantages and would probably quite comfortably score a victory over victory, um, unless it was dumb enough to let victory get off something like a double shotted broadside first that happened to be rather chaotic for its gun crews or got raked like Bucentar did, but both of those are they say we assumed a competent crew so we're going to assume those don't happen so yeah the close range firefight pennsylvania obvious advantage by size number of guns and weight of shot however where victory may have a chance of victory really we name these things <laughs> well anyway um is in a medium to long range firefight 
and that's because they had to shorten up and lighten those uh, middle and main gun deck 32 pounders so their range is not as great so if victory can hold the distance which given its sailing characteristics it probably can a really clever officer on the victory might be able to hang at say medium say medium to medium long range and victory has all long guns um, on all three of its main gun decks now fair enough the the long guns on the upper gun deck are probably not going to be that effective against a ship of the line um, although they might be useful at uh, dismasting or damaging the sails or clearing out crew etc but it means that victory does have two gun decks with long guns that are effective a gun deck full of 24 pounders and a gun deck full of 32 pounders which means say at medium to medium longish range victory actually has a firepower advantage because it's got two sets of deck gun, uh, two gun decks that can reach out to that distance, whereas Pennsylvania would just have the one. Um, the middle gun deck might just about reach, but it's not going to be that effective. Um, at which point, Victory could try and go for the same kind of victory that uh, the British pulled off against the USS Essex in the War of 1812, which is just to sit at range and shoot the thing full of holes until it gives up. Um, which is possible, uh, and is doable, whether or not it would ever occur to a British captain to stand off from a target and just bombard it at long range when it's not blatantly obvious to do so remains to be seen, but there is a theoretical um, and entirely plausible way of winning there for victory, so yeah. Um, in terms of commonly held naval tactics, yes, victory could pull off a win, but in the kind of close-range firefight that most British first rates seem to favour, um, Pennsylvania has all the advantages. Tis Francis Fault asks, Have you seen the Dan Snow documentary Empire of the Seas? Uh, it's an interesting take that the needs of the Navy was a major driver of the development of Britain both politically and industrially. I was wondering on your take on that idea. And the answer is yes, I've seen the series, I have the book, and I've actually met Dan Snow as well. The man is absurdly tall. Uh, I mean, I'm, okay, fair enough, I'm not the world's tallest person, but I'm six foot nothing, and, well, it was like being back in primary school, because it's like, oh, hello, um, incredibly tall person, I, I shall beseech you with questions, with the appropriate um, craning of neck from a position down below your mighty gaze. <laughs> no, seriously, um, I'll see if I can dig up a photo at some point um, that was taken, yeah, anyway. Absurdly tall Dan Snow aside, and uh, that was at a uh, debate for, um, debate lecture regarding Jutland, um, for those of you who are interested. Anyway, um, back to topic, track. Come on, you're not that tired yet. Um, I broadly agree with the idea, if you, uh, with a take on it. If you look at the way Britain developed during the 17th, 18th, 19th, and to a degree the 19th centuries, the Navy did have a huge influence on the politics and industry of Britain. Um, I mean, politically, Britain, pretty much since the period of the Tudors and the Spanish Armada, needed a Navy to be able to defend itself. And the parties that were strongly in favour for naval defence uh, and strengthening the Navy generally tended to be the ones that would be favoured by the electorate. Um, the little issue about ship money with uh, James the James the first and notwithstanding, or no Charles the first, sorry James the first, uh, whichever one of the first Stuarts raised ship money, I can't remember at this point. Anyway, um, yeah, that notwithstanding, generally a party that was against the navy wasn't really doing itself any favours in the elections. Um, on top of that the fact that the navy was so large um, required the development of new industries to support them which obviously focused the economy down circuit and lines and things like the first mass manufacturing for uh, rigging tackle blocks as again as this is actually a question from the infrastructure video so as covered there um, that drove some of the first mass production in the world and the need to move large amounts of heavy naval supplies 
um, also inspired a lot of other mechanization uh, type options so the industry side definitely was affected by that um, and going back briefly to the political side of things because the navy was so vital and remember initially it was almost entirely for defense to stop other people coming over with their navies and oppressing britain um, and then once the royal navy started to gain an equal footing or upper hand over most of the european navies it first became a way of trying to secure british trade um, and that obviously has huge political and in, uh, industrial implications if your tr overseas trade is secure and numerous um, and then when other people started to get jealous and started um, trying to kick the Royal Navy, or well, to kick the British out of various uh, trade ports, the Royal Navy was instrumental in uh, letting the British turn around and say, well, actually, no, We how about we kick you out of your trade ports, and uh, then we can trade nice and safely and happily. This is pretty much how a large portion of the British Empire up to about 1820 was actually secured, um, when various European powers couldn't play ball with each other and started fighting over who should have exclusive trade access to this or that trade port um, and sometimes it didn't even involve the British sometimes the British merchants were just caught in the crossfire but it almost invariably ended with a squadron of Royal Navy ships showing up and ordering everybody else at Cannon Point to play nice or, or else and then usually they didn't and then the British were like okay well we'll make you play nice with grape shot and round shot and forced marches to other places and thank you for the port where we can now be nice and peaceful thank you very much repeat that about 400 times like how did we end up owning a quarter of the world again oh yeah because other people wouldn't play nice thanks a lot dutch <laughs> oh well dutch portuguese uh spanish french mm, more french mainly <laughs> Celestial Republic asks, what do you think would have happened if Shinano was completed as a battleship? So that's the third of the Yamato class. Um, well, realistically, the most likely answer is the US Navy's aircraft would have happened to it. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened to Musashi and Yamato. Uh, yeah, um, at that stage in the war, there's not really a tremendous amount it can do apart from maybe shoot down a dozen or two of the aircraft that will inevitably be sent to swarm the blasted thing. Um, either that or it'll never have enough fuel and will just sit in port and, or in the inner seas of Japan and not accomplish all that much. Um, yeah, there's not really a lot that Shinano could have done realistically by that, by that stage in the war. Um Although, given what it accomplished as a carrier, which was basically to give the US Navy the world's biggest submarine kill to date of a warship, you'd be hard-pressed to accomplish less <laughs> than it did as a carrier. It, it, assuming they actually complete the blaster thing before sending it out to submarine-infested waters, it might at least attract, to say, a few torpedoes and bombs and absorb some of the US Navy's uh, gigantic stockpile of ammunition before it eventually goes down. William Burke asks, how were masts manufactured? Are they essentially just giant tree trunks or are they multiple wooden cylinders attached to each other? Given the context of which video this is in, I'm going to assume it's referring to masts of Age of Sail ships uh, rather than the masts of not era warships so masts could be manufactured in a number of ways the ideal way as far as the thinking of the time went was in fact to uh, as you say basically make it out of one gigantic tree trunk the only downside of this was that a tree trunk that size um, of, of, for obvious reasons usually some form of evergreen like a fir um, fir tree those tree trunks were pretty darn rare. This is actually one of the major driving reasons why the Royal Navy showed up off of uh, the Danish uh, harbour and port of Copenhagen in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars and shot it to pieces and stole half the, uh, the Danish fleet because Denmark had joined the League of Armed Neutrality and was therefore, to a degree, threatening the Royal Navy's ability to access the Baltic where supplies of some of the best mast timber were located and it was a, a, enough of a strategic threat that well 
the Royal Navy actually added to its list of countries we are at war with, circa beginning of the 19th century, purely to defend its supply of um, ship rigging and mast materials. And that was pretty much one of the few places left where you could actually get those things because another fairly substantial source of such uh, timbers a little while earlier had been the American colonies, which for obvious reasons were also no longer available as easy pickings, albeit the Americans would sell you decent mast timber, but it would cost you a lot. And um, with a lot of ships, with a lot of masts, and a lot of masts that needed replacing due to battle damage, that wasn't an, exactly an economically viable option, especially given the, the shipping time and distances involved. Um, but anyway, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it is to still get fairly substantial timbers, but to, and also this applies when masts get very large, to s step them together. So this consists, as you can possibly see in this picture, I'm not entirely sure, um, but this basically consists of having your the lower part of your mast go up as high as you can. It's not going to go up as high as you need, so what you then do is you bind and strap another mast, effectively, a slightly thinner one, uh, to the first mast for a length of about 15 to 20 feet, but give or take, depending on the size of your mast. Um, and that creates obviously a slight step effect, but then that allows you to use that second uh, piece of mast timber to run the mast up in theory to as high as you need, and if not, you just repeat the process again. Um, and if you need to repeat it a fourth time, you've probably really, really screwed up on your mast timber sourcing, so don't even think about it. So that's that's another way of building a mast. And then the final way of building a mast is if you're really desperate and you can't even find shorter mast timber, um, you can actually build up a mast cylinder out of several of strips and strakes of lesser wood, thinner wood, and you would cut and shape these into approximate wedge wedge shapes, bundle them together all in a vaguely cylindrical shape, and then you'd have to strap and bolt that entire collection together. Um, and this was done only as an emergency measure because it was weaker than single solid pieces of timber. But beggars can't be choosers, and in the middle of a war where it's at the case of, well, you can either have this composite mast or you can have nothing, you'd go with a composite mast. And to a certain degree, although not as much as good mast timber, you can also step those. Beedrillbot121 asks two questions. One, if Rodney had managed to sink both Bismarcks, would she have been e put either put in reserve, kept as a museum ship, or would she still have been scrapped? And secondly, if a second rate was forced to fight a first rate due to being in a narrow channel, would the strategy be to escape or to win? So the case for preserving HMS Rodney, if in a hypothetical scenario it managed to be the lead ship in sinking Bismarck and then gone on to also be the lead ship in sinking Tirpitz, the case for preserving it would have been a heck of a lot stronger. Um, whether or not you there you would have managed to pull it off, they scrapped War Spite. Um, and they historically scrapped Rodney. <laughs> Britain was really, really broke. Um, keeping it in reserve is n not really an option. It's weird because Rodney was actually basically put into reserve and semi-prepared for scrapping even before the war was over because she went into the war not having had the, a refit as recently as Nelson did. She was then used a lot harder and she didn't get a chance for a major refit. Nelson, courtesy of uh, Axis Torpedo Bomber in the early part of no the 1940s, did spend several months in a dockyard in America, which gave it a chance to get a sort of a semi, a small refit compared, and that went on top of the fact that it had been refitted uh, later than its sister ship, therefore was um, in a better condition in, to start with. But anyway... Um, there was a semi-pie-in-the-sky dream by Churchill to refit Nelson for use post-war, but simply put, A, material condition, but B, also one of the many reasons that Churchill's idea got shut down, it's just too slow. Um, it's too slow for work in the post-war environment. So no, it's not going to go into reserve. 
uh, being kept as a museum ship is possible if it's a ship that's if it's the the Royal Navy battleship that sunk two ships that are considerably larger than it is, and therefore making it the most successful uh, dreadnought era battleship of the Royal Navy by a considerable margin. Then you might just about be able to swing it as a museum ship. Um, there's still going to be a fairly high chance it should be scrapped though. Now, as far as a second-rate fighting a first-rate goes, it's going to depend very much on what the two ships are, because you could end up with a fight where the second-rate is a 98-gun ship and the first-rate is a 100-gun ship, at which point, well, there's only two guns in it, so the second-rate might as well go for the win. Um, whereas it might also be that the second rate is a 90-gun ship and its opponent might be 120, 130, or in the case of Santissima Trinidad, 144-gun ship, in which case, the, um, on paper, the options would be skedaddle very, very quickly. Um, if it was a British second rate versus the Santissima Trinidad, they'd probably try and fight it anyway because that's pretty much how they operated for most of the... Uh, most of that uh, era of conflict, but yes, as I say, it, it would depend almost entirely on how the ship's captain perceived the fighting capabilities of his own ship versus the fighting capabilities of uh, the enemy, and so withdrawal obviously would be more of an option when the second rate was smaller and the first rate considerably larger, and as they trend towards each other, it's far more likely the second rate captain is going to try and engage. That's not a captain who is second rate, he is the captain of the second rate. You know what I mean. Matthew Dobbs asks, have you visited Hermione? Well, nice as it sounds, I don't think Emma Watson is taking random visitors showing up on her doorstep, even if I knew where her doorstep was. Um, but in all seriousness, now I'm pretty sure he's referring to the French replica frigate Hermione, as now seen here. Now, technically yes, but also no, in that I have been to... Uh, Bordeaux in France, uh, stayed there for just over a week, and I was next to the dock where Hermione is based. Unfortunately, it was pre-2014, and she was still under construction. I think it was 2013, um, so all I got was a uh, face full of hoarding and some very nice uh, pictures and text that was all in French, which I could just about decipher with my uh, B grade in GCSE French, that roughly informed me as to what the heck was going on behind the dock, the, the, behind the hoarding in the dock, but I couldn't see anything. So yes, I've technically been in the area, but I haven't actually visited her as completed. Um, I'd like to see her completed. Um, <laughs> given the way things are going at the time of this recording, I think I better use my... Uh, October break to pop down into Europe before uh, the the gates close and I become uh, persona non grata on the continent uh, simply by dint of being English but never mind um, yeah I, I would love to go and see the ship now it's completed I'd say about well yeah one thing when I went there the, before I drove I am not driving to Bordeaux again oh uh, that gives me shivers no 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 no, no. I'm taking a plane Taking a plane, then hiring a car and trying to remember how to drive on the wrong side of the road again. Napoleon has so much to answer for. Alright, let's get on to some Patreon questions. Um, George Armatus asks, Did the morale of the Grand Fleet suffer after Jutland, considering Jutland did not turn out great for the British and that they didn't do that much after? Did the morale of British crews suffer? Also, was there any public outrage that so much money had been spent on having the biggest fleet in the world, only to fight a few inconclusive battles while most of the fighting and dying was happening on land? Um, so, morale in the Grand Fleet, it did suffer immediately after Jutland. Um especially on the ships that were sort of sent home a little bit early because of damage such as war spite, uh, because basically the, the German propaganda industry was very quick on its feet to get its message out after Jutland, um, and the Royal Navy uh, wasn't, basically. The Royal Navy kind of sat back and said, well, we don't know what's happened yet because none of, not all of our ships are back in, and uh, then we've got to evaluate what all their various logs, see what's actually happened, then we'll tell you what's happened. Um, 
But with the Germans loudly trumpeting that they'd won a decisive victory, combined with the Royal Navy not really saying anything other than wait for a week and trust us, it did sound to the general public and to a lot of the crews, because obviously on a battle of that scale, the crews are only going to see a small part of it, it did begin to sound like maybe the Germans had won a decisive victory and... Yeah, morale in the Grand Fleet did suffer at that point. It bounced back quite... And this kind of works out into the public realm side of things you asked for as well. Um, it did bounce back quite significantly um, in a relative short period of time, and that was mainly actually thanks, again, to the German propaganda ministry, because they kind of shot themselves in the foot in as much as, let's face it, the Germans inflicted some quite spectacular losses on the Royal Navy, but... A propaganda ministry being a propaganda ministry, or as we'd call it these days, a PR department, um, had the, they couldn't quite resist overinflating things quite significantly. Um, they were claiming all sorts of weird and wonderful and wild things about sinking significant portions of the Grand Fleet. And it very quickly became clear that actually that hadn't happened at all um, and combined with the Royal Navy then coming back with verified facts about well the status of the, the Royal Navy itself and also then putting out its own claims as to how many ships had sunk which were also inflated albeit not by quite as much as the German claims when it was obvious that the Germans were blatantly lying and the Germans very quickly clammed up about exactly what they had lost everybody suddenly started to doubt the German claims at all um, so and then obviously with the Admiral saying well actually you know, we won and here's why even if their claims were themselves a bit uh, off kilter people believed them a lot more because well uh, they could prove that the Royal Navy hadn't lost several battleships because you could go and see those several battleships and the Royal Navy was um, generally relatively willing to own up to the ships that had been lost and the, the Germans sudden clamming up about exactly what they'd lost seemed very suspicious as I say combined with the fact they'd been caught red-handed lying about uh, what they damage they'd done on the Royal Navy um, the public outrage about money spent on the Royal Navy kind of followed a similar kind of uh, curve in the aftermath of Jutland in terms of afterwards, they did actually do a fair bit. They did sweeps and convoy escort duty, albeit that that was very boring and a lot of Royal Navy crew did complain about it. There was a little bit of um, boredom and morale sort of yo-yoing a bit, but not by as much as you'd imagine. There were still quite a number of, of, of urgent deployments going after the high seas fleet, although they didn't result in battles um, and other kinds of action on smaller unit scales that occurred post Battle of Jutland, so it wasn't. It was they basically the Royal Navy was not as bored or con constrained to port as much as the High Seas Fleet was. So their their morale didn't suffer as much, and with obviously a lot of those smaller actions like Second Battle of Heligoland and Bight, for example, generally there was something to celebrate about them, even if, if they weren't usually absolutely stunning, crushing victories. Um, so yeah. And most people recognise that the the blockade at sea was having an effect. And to be honest, although by a lot, of, as you said, although a lot of the fighting numerically by people was being done on land, the simple fact of the matter was that the fighting on land really wasn't going very far in World War One for the bulk of it. Whereas even a qualified victory by the Navy at sea, even if it was only a small small forces action, say between destroyers and a few light cruisers, was still something where you could quantifiably put your finger on it and say, you know, we won that one. We might have taken some losses, but we won. And that kind of kept the Navy in everyone's good books because for a long time it seemed like they were the only ones actually producing anything in terms of actual victories, as opposed to the land campaign, which is said there's a lot of dying going on, but it was a lot of dying, not a lot of changing of lines. Okay, and then we'll do two more. So Leon Wu asks, uh, you've mentioned triple expansion engines in pre-dreadnoughts and older. What exactly are these and why are they so inferior to turbines? So a triple expansion engine is, a, well, you can see here, a cutaway of one. Uh, so it works from left to right. So steam goes in the left and eventually comes out the right. Now the reason it's called a triple expansion engine is because 
effectively this kind of engine works on the principle of you put the steam in one place, the steam expansion uh, pushes the cylinder down, you therefore get kinetic energy in the form of movement out of it, and then obviously as the steam condenses it forms a vacuum which collapses and pulls the thing back up again and repeat the process and round and round you go. Great. The problem with the initial steam engine is that this gets you some energy but the steam that comes out at the end is actually still quite hot so you're losing um, quite a bit of the heat that you are generating in your boiler so it's in a very inefficient form of uh, propulsion but the heat that you've got left in that steam is not enough to actually sustain the ship the, to, to actually push the, the cylinder down and so they then invented the double uh, expansion engine and the reason it's vertical is obviously you see the engine is mounted vertically uh, that's how it works um, but anyway so the double expansion engine added the second cylinder and this cylinder was able to use the build-up of pressure from this lower energy steam to get a bit more kinetic energy out of it which was great fantastic so you've you've got a little bit more energy out of uh, this the steam which means you're getting more of the energy you've put in via fuel um, the vertical triple expansion engine as illustrated here as will come as no surprise basically just extend this principle further with a third expansion chamber to get even more energy out of the same bit of the same bit of steam um, some of the last of the uh, expansion engine powered uh, ocean liners even had quadruple expansion engines but those didn't seem to find their way into capital ships really because uh, turbines were better at that point so that's what a triple expansion engine is as for why they're inferior to turbines uh, well they're they are less efficient than turbines um, they and as a result they obviously they don't they you need more fuel to go the same distance they also generate a heck of a lot more uh, um, vibration and uh, movement uh, which means is for even further le even less efficiency um, as, uh, not just the fact they don't use quite as much energy from the steam um, so they tend to basically shake themselves apart at max speed after a while um, so if you are running at your ship's theoretical max speed, let's say 21 knots, with a turbine engine, assuming that you've kept that turbine in fairly good repair, you can run a ship at 21 knots until you've pretty much run out of fuel. A uh, vertical triple expansion engine, most of them you can run up to maybe eight, so anywhere between 8 and 24 hours at max speed if you're really lucky, um, at, after which point they'll either have shaken themselves apart or seized up. Um, so, which isn't good. And also, as you might imagine from the sheer size of this thing, they take up an awful lot of space and an awful lot of space that can occasionally poke the engine room either above the water line, which is dangerous, or through the height you need for the engine room, poke other things that you'd rather not have above the water line, up, um, above that, that area of the ship. So, uh, turbines allow you to have your entire engine uh, block space much lower in the ship. It allows you to keep other things lower in the ship and although turbines can and will generate vibration it's not as bad and they're more durable than VTEs at high speeds so durability efficiency lack of vibration and especially for warships uh, tactical soundness of being able to mount them lower in the ship and thus better protected is why uh, turbines are super, much superior to vertical triple expansions amongst various other reasons and lastly for this week, Christopher R. asks, um, who do you think had a greater effect long-term on the Royal Navy? Admiral Nelson for the fighting spirit in Ilan he imparted to the Royal Navy. Don't let, you, don't let him hear you using a French word to describe anything he imparted to the Royal Navy, but never mind. Um, or Admiral Jackie Fisher for all the technological advances he helped to bring to the, bring to the RN in his tenure. I am going to go with Nelson for long-term effect um, and that's because although and that's not to undersell what Jackie Fisher did for the Royal Navy Jackie Fisher probably put the Royal Navy in a position where it could win the naval aspect of World War One. without him 
I'd have serious doubts as to whether the Royal Navy would be in a position to dominate the seas in World War One to the extent that it did. I'm not necessarily saying it would have lost, but it would have been a hell of a lot harder fight um, with the potential of losing. Uh, if you look at the state the Royal Navy was in in the 1890s going into the 1900s. Um, but that's a, that's a matter for a completely separate video, um, probably a special on Jackie Fisher himself. Um, anyway, but the, anyway, the, the main problem, the main thing I see with Jackie Fisher's changes is, yes, he got rid of a lot of old dross, he got a lot of new ideas in, he got a lot of technological innovation in. However, the pace of technological advancement is forever ongoing, and all navies go through phases where they get stuck in their ways a bit and have to be dragged out in kicking and screaming into the the new dawn of uh, a new age of technology and then they'll be driven to become the leaders in it for a bit and then they'll go back into the same old habit and so on and so forth it's it's a it's a long-term naval uh, cycle jackie fisher pulled the royal navy out of one of its worst periods of complacency and as i say got it ready for the first world war in a lot of respects so it's a huge achievement what he did but as i say it's something that can and will always happen to navies and will always need someone to pull them out of it whereas the fighting spirit and the idea of the royal navy as embedded into the national consciousness by nelson of a force that goes out and fights and wins and even if it doesn't win battles will always win the war and even when it loses battles will do so with great gallantry trying its absolute best to inflict damage on the enemy that is something that not all navies have um and so it's something that some navies have had and have lost uh nelson seems generally speaking to have been able to impart that in some manner to the royal navy from then onwards and th therefore by dint of the fact that it's fundamentally altered the way the Royal Navy sees itself and fights f for the past 200 or so years you've got to give him uh, the, the, the prize in this particular competition now that's not to say the Royal Navy wasn't a very determined professional fighting force beforehand but as with some other navies it fluctuated back and forth and it could even fluctuate back and forth between different admirals in the same war uh, as nelson found out if he, if he was offering under one admiral they could be very hide bound and would achieve the bare minimum necessary to ch declare victory and then go away others admirals like uh, admiral jervis would f actually go for the jugular and would be very disappointed if any of the enemy ships got away post nelson uh, the Royal Navy doesn't back down from fights. It sometimes uh, accepts fights that are hopelessly against the odds and, and the ships in question get thoroughly kicked in for it, but all that really ever inspires the Navy to do is to send in even more and bigger ships to make sure whoever did it didn't get away with it. Um, and you can see that across the board. I mean, uh, a pre-Nelson a pre Royal Navy... At uh, the times when it's at its worst, if it was confronted with something like the American frigates, might have gone, oh, it's, it's not worth it, let's just go and keep the blockade up against Napoleon, that's easier. Um, in, say, in competition with the French, it might have gone, oh, the French have won up to us, oh, I suppose we'll have to build some kind of duplicate response instead of building warrior. Um, uh, Admiral, uh, the ad Admiral at the Battle of Coronel, um, you can tell how tired I am, I've even forgotten, Admiral Craddock, that's it, Admiral Craddock at the Battle of Coronel, um, hopelessly outmatched without the Canopus, um, facing, uh, Ad uh, Admiral von Spee, still goes for it, and when he is destroyed, the Royal Navy's response isn't, ah, well, I guess we've lost control of that area of the ocean. It's send in a couple of battle cruisers and make damn sure whoever killed uh, Admiral Craddock and his squadron doesn't get away with it. And the same thing with the Bismarck. Uh, it's not a case of, oh, we've lost our flagship. We better stay away from this highly dangerous enemy ship while we consider some way of 
uh, destroying it in the future. It's a case of literally anyone in range with any chance of getting in range attack now and don't stop attacking till this thing is sunk. It's it's a step change in naval thinking that is, I say, well, from those examples you can tell, it lasts and it has lasted, and even even up into conflicts like the Falklands War, where you had as I've mentioned a few times before in various videos, the hilariously inappropriately named Captain Coward do planning to do things like use his ship as live bait um, and stand in the path of the Argentinian Air Force and his equally wonderful plan to take a squadron of Royal Navy frigates out for a gun duel with a Belgrano if it had ever shown up. Um, it's it's not something that can be downplayed. Um, it, it's... And then this isn't to say that Royal Navy captains are like Viking berserkers or Warhammer 40,000 orcs that just charge in at the slightest sign of trouble. They are still trained to be very cunning and devious little people um, who will do their absolute level best to shank you in the back before they have to confront you in a straight-up engagement. But they will, they will do everything in their power once their eyes are set on you to make sure that they're the ones going home and you're not. And... By and large, that has basically been the way the Royal Navy's fought ever since Nelson. So the uh, end result of this rather extensive polemic that's almost carried me up to full time anyway uh, is to basically say the, the very short answer to your question is not to downplay Admiral Fisher, but the the fighting spirit and ethos that Nelson gave the Royal Navy has to be by far the, the, the greater effect. And, uh, well... Long may it continue for as long as the Royal Navy is. So, thank you very much for watching this incredibly fatigued drag edition of the Dry Dock. Um, sorry we couldn't quite make an hour, but I'm basically running on fumes at this point. As you could probably tell, my mind started going a little bit in terms of memory. Um, and I had to cut out things like the sources video and the general responses video. Um, section because trying to work those sections into this video at this time of the morning now when I'm supposed to be doing a four hour drive in four hours <laughs> oh no why um, and I've already done seven hours of driving today but anyway enough enough pity about poor old Drac and his incredibly uh, busy lifestyle but yeah there's a there's a reason this is slightly shorter hope you understand hope you don't mind regular service will we resume next week and next week we'll also have the winners of the battle cruiser design competition announced um so yes thank you very much for listening and if it's all right with you i'm gonna get some sleep <laughs>